once I'm dealing with samples in the frequency domain, I'm going to sum those values over a single period of the, of the waveform. All of that stuff together, we, get, we, we do it often enough, we're going to call it circular convolution. Okay, so circular convolution. So, you know, the, the punchline there is, um, uh, is that the waveforms you're, you're convolving are actually um, the uh, periodic extension. Let me rewrite the formula here and just show you the notation. So I'm going to say um, that x1 of n, and I'm going to use a new symbol for convolution, and the block size matters, so I'm going to take n, draw a little circle around it to say this is circular convolution. And it's not real standard notation, but it's your notation that your book uses, and it's as good as any other notation it's used. So, yeah, so when we want to talk about circular convolution, definition is the summation we just derived. So I'm going to take a sum over some dummy variable, m equals 0 to n minus 1. That's the number of samples we're convolving over. x1 of m times x2 of n minus m, but that second index I got to take modulo but however many samples I'm dealing with. Okay, so there's kind of my definition of what I mean by circular convolution. The property we just derived says if I circularly convolve two functions together, and I look at the endpoint DFT, I end up just multiplying those DFT's values together. Okay. Um, the property we didn't derive is the dual property, right? If I, if I take conjugates on both sides, I end up with just repeating the same derivation. So second property is if, if I multiply in the time domain instead of multiplying in the frequency domain, I end up doing a circular convolution over here. And there's actually, uh, because of that 1 over n factor in the DFT, I get an extra 1 over n factor out here as well. Okay, so let me write it down here. So this is an endpoint circular convolution between the two transforms. Okay, so there's my convolution and multiplication properties. Okay, and basically the, the concept you have to remember is if I'm dealing with frequency domain samples, the signal I'm going to deal with is always going to be a periodic extension of the one that I start with. I'm going to give you one other property here real quick, just to kind of wrap this up, and that's Parseval's theorem. Okay, and Parseval's theorem ends up being useful. It's easy to calculate power in a frequency domain. And so basically, um, this is power calculations in, in, in the frequency domain. And, 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 you know, we use it like, you know, if we're interested in distortion, we might want to add up only the power and the harmonics that are created by a distortion sequence. Parseval's theorem lets me relate the power calculations in the time domain to what's going on in the frequency domain. And I think we're going to leave the proof of this to a homework, so I'll give you this, this one. Um, so I'm going to sum over values of n, and I'm assuming I'm summing over a single period of the waveform. And the generic form of Parseval's theorem, I, ju I just take those two, a, a signal multiplied by the conjugate of a second signal, and that ends up being a multiplication in the frequency domain as well. There's a 1 over n factor out here summation over frequency, all frequencies, x of k, y conjugate of k. So there's the generic form of Parseval theorem. I think we'll give you that for a homework problem. You go ahead and do the summation and work it out. Um, the special case, by far the most common form of Parseval theorem you're going to see is where x and y are both equal, and that way the summation ends up being a power calculation. 0 to n minus 1, if I find the average power in a waveform, magnitude of x1 of n squared, 
I get the actually I'm just using x and y equal to each other, taking number times as conjugate because you know magnitude squared. That's what we it's proportional to what we called power in the frequency domain. One over n summation over values of k magnitude x of k squared. Okay, so there's the form of Parsifal's theorem we see kind of all the time. All right. I think we'll take uh, another break here um, just to keep my lectures you know, more or less under control and uh, pick it up there next time.